sue the state of Chiapas under the North American Free Trade Agreement. So no matter what happens, no matter if the mining companies involved in corruption, involved in, in, in killing somebody, uh, uh, ecological damage, the Canadian diplomacy in Mexico continues to defend uh, uh, the mining company. Uh, on another, uh, halfway across the world, in Papua New Guinea, the Porgera mine, run by Barrett Gold, uh, has been a site of immense conflict for years now. Uh, incredible ecological damage. Uh, 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 Eight million tons of sediment is, uh, is um, dumped into the local, local community every year. Uh, uh, hundreds and hundreds of indigenous people have had their houses destroyed to, to allow uh, the mine to operate. The mine operates in large part because they have 400 to 500 security services, uh, security officers uh, working for the mine. Uh, they, those security officers, alongside local police, have killed between eight and 14 uh, opponents of the mine in, in recent years. And uh, the, the, there's been an immense amount of rape by the mining security uh, uh, um, towards local communities that are in, in opposition uh, to the mine. The rape being used as a, a tactic of, of, uh, of uh, intimidation. Uh, the head of the mine, or head of Barrett Gold, uh, Peter Monk, who I'm sure some of you are, are familiar with Peter Monk. Uh, some people are familiar with Peter Monk. He's leading uh, Canadian capitalist, uh, uh, very uh, feted in the Globe and Mail and others. Other places. Uh, in March 2011, he told the Golden Mail that that quote, gang rape is a cultural habit uh, in Papua New Guinea. So he justified the mining companies, security services, repeatedly raping uh, uh, local women by the fact that, of course, it's just a, a cultural habit. The, the these backwards people, of course, um, that's that's what they do. Uh, the mine is is uh, has been. Because of the, the conflict and the, 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 uh, the ecological damage uh, created by the mine, Norway's uh, uh, investment arm has delisted from Barrett Gold. The uh, UN Commissioner for Human Rights uh, um, <coughs> condemned the, pra the, the, the rape, rapes taking place by, uh, by the Barrett Gold security forces, and yet you have the Global Mail, you have uh, Canadian diplomacy continuing to support uh, Barrett Gold. So these are just two small examples, and they're literally all over the world. There's an example that Sam mentioned in, in, in Guatemala, and pretty much at this point, you can pick any country in the global south, and you will find an example of a Canadian operating mine that is causing social uh, conflict, people being killed, people being beaten by security forces, or is causing ecological, uh, serious ecological uh, uh, destruction in the local uh, communities. And it's gotten so bad that even the Mining Association, the Mining Association of Canada, has essentially admitted uh, 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 the problem. And in a report that was leaked uh, to the press, uh, uh, about Canadian uh, uh, mining operations between 1999 and, and 2009, the Pro Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada Commission report said, quote, Canadian companies have been the most significant group involved in unfortunate incidents in the developing world. Canadian companies are more likely to be, to be engaged in community conflict, environmental and, un and, and unethical behavior. This is coming internally. This is the, the, the prospectors and develop, developers association of Canada admitting that Canadian companies are involved in immense social conflict globally. And yet, what is the reaction of our government? What's the reaction of the Harper government? Uh, is it to try to find ways to rein in some of these worst practices? Is it to uh, uh, you know, develop laws that will allow uh, communities and individuals that are affected by Canadian mines to sue those companies in Canadian courts? No, it's a total opposite. Uh, even after a round table of civil society organizations, uh, mining companies, including the Mining Association of Canada, uh, uh, academics, etc., 
that was started by the previous Liberal government in 2005, came out with 27 recommendations that were adopted unanimously, this, this, this roundtable. So including the Mining Association of Canada, ostensibly agreed to these recommendations. Uh, the Harper government absolutely refused to adopt these recommendations, which would basically have put some constraints on the ways in which Canadian diplomacy uh, could support companies that were found to be involved in unethical behavior. I.e., if a company had uh, you know, killed someone, or their security forces had killed someone, Canadian Export Development uh, Canada money would no longer go to supporting that money. The Canadian Embassy would no longer uh, provide diplomatic support to that mining company, or Canadian aid wouldn't go to supporting that mining company. Not that the, not that the mining company officials should be sitting in jail, which is what they should be doing, if their company is involved in killing people abroad or causing immense ecological damage, but simply that the Canadian state would no longer provide that support. The Harper government blocked any or blocked the recommendations when uh, John McKay, a Liberal MP, put forward a bill, Bill C-300, that would have basically done that to stop the official support for mining companies involved in abuses abroad. That was voted down in the House of Commons by, unfortunately, six votes, the Conservatives entirely, and uh, 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 Michael Ignacio and a few Liberals actually going against their own party's private members' bill and, uh, and uh, uh, abstaining and not providing the votes to actually uh, pass that legislation. Instead of mandatory rules, on Canadian mining companies or, or, or ending support for mining companies involved in abuses abroad, what the, what the Conservative government has done is uh, put forward this corporate social responsibility uh, initiative. And this is what this institute is about. It's about diverting attention, in part, it's about diverting attention from what's really needed, which are laws, regulations that will bring in some minimal oversight of the Canadian mining companies, that will end official support of the Canadian mining companies abroad, and in an incredibly embarrassing blow to the Harper government's uh, corporate social responsibility uh, project, um, one of the things they, they set up was an office of the extractive se uh, sector, um, and they appointed a woman by the name of Margaret, uh, Margetta Evans uh, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to head this up. And basically the idea is it was going to provide some oversight of Canada's mining sector abroad. Uh, this woman, she, had, she was formerly the, the head of the, the Monk Institute at, UB, uh, at, uh, at U of T in Toronto. The Monk Institute obviously being funded by Peter Monk, the head of Bear Gold. So this was somebody who was very close uh, uh, to the mining sector. But she was supposed to head this up to, to provide some oversight. Now, she wasn't given any powers to actually bring any remedy or to bring any sanction against my, any mining companies that uh, were being pursued. Uh, she was basically just able to sort of bring, uh, um, bring the company that was accused of abuses and those accusing the company of abuses together to try to find some, some sort of uh, uh, way out of uh, the problem. Now, of course, what happens in a situation like that is a company that is gonna engage in abuses abroad is obviously not going to sit down and uh, uh, come up with a remedy unless they're forced to. Uh, so two weeks ago, uh, Margaret, Margaretta Evans finally resigned after four years, quietly resigned from this position because <coughs> over those four years, there had been six different disputes brought to her. Um, uh, and in each case, the company simply walked away uh, from, from uh, uh, the dispute process. They just said, sorry, we don't want to participate, and she had no powers to oversee uh, bringing any remedy, bringing any sanction against the company. And so this institute we're talking about here at UBC today is tied directly to this corporate social responsibility uh, initiative that the Harper government has set up, and this uh, office of uh, the extractive sector um, is, uh, is one element, and it has just collapsed. So I think that it won't, it won't surprise me. It's actually very embarrassing for UBC uh, to be continuing down this path, even as um, uh, an important element of the Harper government's corporate social responsibility 
uh, uh, project is is uh, is uh, is uh, collapsing in in on itself. So part of there's an immense number of abuses by Canadian mining companies abroad, um, and the Harper government has refused to to do anything to try to stop those abuses. Uh, and but so that's part of the story. The other part of the story that I want to convey here today is just the extent to which Canadian foreign policy goes to supporting mining interests abroad. Right? All arms of the Canadian state are involved in this project. From the diplomats in Canadian embassies abroad or Canadian high commissions abroad who spend much of their days working to advance Canadian mining interests in Ecuador and in, in, uh, Mexico, uh, in Ghana, uh, uh, etc. to even the Canadian military being involved in some of this, this process. And uh, to give you a sense of just how aggressive uh, Canadian mining uh, lobbying is abroad, uh, in February of 2012, Anthony Bevington, who's the director of the Graduate School of Geography at Clark University in the US, he told uh, uh, to the Committee on Foreign Affairs and International Development, quote, a subsecretary sub in a Latin American Ministry of Mines told him that, quote, as far as I can tell, the Canadian ambassador here is a representative for Canadian mining companies. He went on to say, uh, I, I quoted another Latin American environment, uh, Latin American environment minister who told him, quote, I don't know if Canada has been quite so discredited in its history. So here you have high officials in uh, uh, Latin American government saying that basically from their perspective, all the Canadian ambassador does is lobbies on behalf of mining companies. And that's probably an exaggeration, but it uh, uh, certainly gives you a sense of, of, uh, of what's going on. Harper himself has repeatedly lobbied abroad on behalf of controversial Canadian mining companies. When he went to Chile in 2007, and Bear Gold, uh, biggest gold company in the world, uh, has a very controversial project there, uh, the Pasco Lambo project, which recently has, has been put on hold. They've been, they've been, they lost uh, their licenses, fortunately. Um, the government had, uh, had, had bowed to uh, popular pressure. When he went to Chile, Harper, went to Barrick's office and said, Barrick Gold follows Canadian standards of corporate social responsibility. Even after more than 2,000 Chileans had just demonstrated against Barrick Gold. Likewise, when Stephen Harper went to Tanzania in 2007, he went to the Barrick Gold operation, and only a few days after Barrick Gold had just uh, defined a strike by miners as illegal and, and suspended uh, a large number of miners, uh, after a number of people had been killed at the Barrick Gold operation in Tanzania, in fact, uh, uh, according to Golden Mail, this is after Harper's visit, but the Golden Mail report on business said that 19 vi villagers have been killed by police and security forces at the North Mara mine operated by Barrick Gold uh, between January 2009 and June of 2010. So in a 16-18 uh, month period, uh, uh, at least 19 people had been killed. Uh, largely because they were they were uh, small uh, um, mine um, uh, operators, they were trying to trying to get <coughs> trying to get gold. Um, Barrick Gold, when when Harper's in Tanzania, he goes and he defends Barrick Gold's interests uh, diplomatically. In Mongolia, the Canadian government set up diplomatic relations with Mongolia entirely, according to Agence France Presse, to support Canadian mining interests in Mongolia. Uh, including, and this, this happened uh, after, the biggest Canadian mining operation there was run by, uh, by Ivanhoe, uh, Robert Friedland, I'm sure some people are familiar with him, he's been a prominent uh, Vancouver area uh, uh, investor for a long time, very controversial fellow. Uh, in 2005, he explained their mine in Mongolia this way. To a, this is to an investor's forum, he said, quote, so we're coming in from outer space and landing at Oi Tolgoi, this is where the mine is. And the, night, and the nice thing about this, there's no people around. The land is flat, there's no tropical jungle, there's no NGOs, we're only 70 kilometers from the Chinese border. It does not snow here. You've got lots of room for waste dumps. 
Just send it openly. It's great. We just going to dump waste all around. Who cares? Who cares what the people in Mongolia have to say? Who cares uh, what, what happens to the environment? Despite that, the Harper government set up diplomatic relations with Mongolia. They got an embassy and actually sent millions and millions of dollars of Canadian aid almost entirely to support Canadian mining interests in Mongolia, uh, which according to uh, one business article, uh, the, the uh, Ivanhoe mine was actually the biggest uh, issue in the 2008 election in Mongolia. Uh, so this is not small, this is you know, serious, serious political importance in Mongolia, Canadian government to support um, uh, uh, mining uh, interests there. Uh, there's something, in, in terms of at the level of uh, free trade agreements and foreign investment protection agreements, you have the Canadian government basically signing a free trade agreement with Peru in 2010 to, to support and protect the interests of the $5 billion in Canadian mining investment in Peru. Uh, they were concerned that Peru, the Peruvian government, that was uh, sort of supposed to be a left-wing government, it didn't, hadn't worked out like that, so I'll leave that uh, uh, aside, but um, that they were concerned that the Peruvian government was going to follow what the Ecuadorian government had done, which was to suspend uh, uh, mining operations for 180 days to look at the situation, uh, uh, to reevaluate the different concessions, uh, so the Harper government signed, with a more right-wing government, signed a, a free trade agreement with the government crew, largely to back the Canadian mining uh, uh, um, investments. And within uh, a year of a year and a half of, of the signing of the free trade agreement, you had the CEO of Bear Creek, which ha had a mining operation at a concession withdrawn after six uh, protesters were killed, and he immediately started threatening to take Peru. Uh, to uh, international arbitration through the free trade agreement. International arbitration is actually basically some, some, uh, some uh, investment lawyers get together <laughs> and decide if a country has the democratic right to, uh, to bring in uh, 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 environmental regulations or to withdraw concessions from, from a corporation. But basically, you had a CEO of a Canadian company threatening to sue for hundreds of millions of dollars the Peruvian government if they uh, maintained their, uh, or they, if they withdrew uh, his, his company's concession. And all across Africa, the Harper government has been, been signing foreign investment uh, promotion and protection agreements uh, with uh, this, just this year with Cote d'Ivoire, Tanzania, Nigeria, Benin, Cameroon, and Zambia. And previously with Madagascar, Mali, Senegal, and they're negotiating with Ghana, Guinea, Tunisia, and Burkina Faso. And basically what these FIFAs are is, some people are familiar with NAFTA's Chapter 11? Some people in the room? Mm -hmm. Basically what that does is that gives international corporations the ability to sue, like the free trade agreement approved, the ability to sue <coughs> the country in a supranational uh, tribunal. So not in domestic courts, but a supranational tribunal it's staffed by investment lawyers. It's all in secret. And they get to challenge the government's uh, uh, withdrawal of the concession, increase the royalty rates, uh, uh, et cetera. Basically, the point is to uh, further protect the Canadian uh, investment interests uh, in that country. And in the, case of, in the case of Africa, we're talking about serious money here. Between 1989 and, uh, and 2011, Canadian mining investment in Africa went from $25 billion, $250 million to over $31 billion, right? We often hear about how China is buying up Africa. You hear that all the time. Corporate media talks about China buying Africa. On a per capita base, Canada is buying up Africa at an infinitely greater rate uh, uh, than, than, than China is. And you have the Canadian government right there behind these Canadian mining companies uh, signing these, pushing, the, the African countries into signing these uh, foreign investment promotion and protection agreements uh, so the Canadian investors have recourse to an international tribunal to sue governments if they're not happy with uh, uh, democratic uh, decisions uh, um, by those governments. And about two weeks ago, Infinity Gold uh, sued Costa Rica for $1 billion because it withdrew its uh, uh, mining concession for a gold mine. 
even though studies show that more than 75% of Costa Ricans are against the project, don't want open pit mine in their country, want to follow uh, 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 decent environmental standards. Of course, Costa Rica has quite a significant uh, uh, ecotourism industry, and, and so this is, you know, would undermine some of that. Despite that, you have the Canadian company suing this country for $1 billion. $1 billion. What does that mean in terms of uh, daycare? What does that mean in terms of education for, for a fairly poor uh, country? Well, what it certainly means is it's a way of intimidating, even if they don't get the full billion dollars, it's a way of intimidating a government to uh, um, uh, follow uh, what the Canadian uh, mining companies want. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, in terms of going further, in terms of how extensive the support for the mining companies abroad is, a couple of weeks ago, I'm sure people saw that uh, uh, it came, came to light that the communications security establishment, uh, based in Ottawa, which is basically Canada's NSA, was spying in Brazil on the Ministry of Mines in Brazil. Right? Uh, we have. Uh, I think it's about 50 Canadian mining companies operating in Brazil, multiple billions of dollars in investment. Presumably, what they were doing when spying on the, Canadian, on the Brazilian mining in, uh, ministry was trying to find intelligence to in, aid Canadian mining companies operating there. We know that there's 200 executives of mining and oil companies in this country that have special clearance uh, in terms of uh, uh, getting uh, uh, classified information. And there's regular biannual meetings between the communication security establishment, CSIS, and uh, uh, top uh, CEOs of different firms. So presumably, I, you know, I don't have the smoking gun here, but presumably the lobbying or the spying in Brazil is designed to advance uh, Canadian uh, corporate interests in that country. And there's, that's not, there's a long history of that uh, uh, in other examples that have been, uh, that have been come to light. One of the more disturbing examples in recent years of Canadian diplomacy at the behest of mining interests is an example with the Congo, one of the poorest countries in the world, uh, huge mineral resource uh, wealth, hundreds of billions of dollars, uh, yeah, some, some estimates go into the trillions of dollars of, of, uh, of uh, uh, natural resources in the Congo, Canadian companies are big players. In September of 2009, the Congolese government withdrew the concession of Vancouver-based First Quantum uh, for an operation in the east of the Congo. And uh, immediately, Harper's government went to bat for the mining company. And they went to bat in, at the Paris Club, among other places, at the Paris Club of Debtor Nations. So Congo has significant foreign debt. Uh, for about th more than three decades, two decades, a brutal dictatorship uh, Mobutu had, had, uh, had uh, accrued a big, significant international debt, and then there was a civil war for, or actually a multi-country war for about six years. So the country had significant debt. All the other members of the Paris Club of Debtor Nations, which is basically the rich countries, um, had agreed to, to reschedule and to eliminate significant elements of Congo's debt. Um, and it was it's odious debt. Why should the impoverished majority of the country pay off what the dictator had funneled into his own pocket. Uh, and after this funneling in his own pocket happened while the Western countries knew what was going on, this money wasn't making its way into the people. This was odious debt. And they should, the majority of the population should not have to repay that debt. Harper government used the debt rescheduling, which was debt far down the path of happening, as a way to put pressure on the Congolese government to come to an agreement with First Quantum. Harper himself went to the World Bank went to the International Monetary Fund uh, on this issue, and the, the uh, uh, Congolese Information Minister said, quote, the Canadian government wants to use the Paris Club of Debtor Nations in order to resolve a particular problem with First Quantum. This is unacceptable. That was what Lombard Mondé said, the Information Minister from, from, from the Congo. The Harper government uh, uh, condemned, got a resolution at the G uh, G8, in Toronto in, in uh, June and July of 2010, got a resolution condemning the Congo's uh, uh, operations or vis a vis mining companies. Uh, took, as I said, took the issue to the, the IMF, the World Bank, to get those institutions to also uh, put pressure 
on the Congolese government uh, over the issue. And they did so despite the fact that in 2002, the United Nations Panel of Experts on the Illegal Exploitation of Natural Resources and Other Forms of Wealth in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. That's actually the title. That's uh, quite a mouthful. Um, they did so despite the fact that the UN Panel of Experts found in 2002 that in its report said, quote, there was collusion, in quotes, between foreign mining companies, foreign mining companies, i.e. First Quantum, and, quote, highly placed government officials who provide mining licenses and export permits in return for private gain. So even though the UN had, uh, eight years earlier, the UN had condemned First Quantum for bribing officials and had actually gotten its concession, First Quantum had gotten its concession in the midst of the Civil War, and they had supported the uh, Laurent Kabila, uh, they supported uh, the leader of, of, of the guerrillas, uh, uh, who, who then become, who wins, and then becomes, uh, takes office, um, and had apparently provided money to him uh, while he's uh, you know, in, involved in the war, despite the fact that the UN had come to that conclusion, the Harper government was willing to block the rescheduling of Congo's debt that had been agreed to by all the major uh, debtors as a way to put pressure on the Congolese government to negotiate with First Quantum uh, and to protect Canadian uh, mining interests in the Congo. So it is, it is an aggressive, aggressive, um, all-in policy of the Harper government on behalf of Canadian mining companies abroad. One other element of this uh, policy is the diverting of Canadian aid money, as the Institute is, is a part of this, um, the, the diverting of Canadian aid money to supporting mining interests abroad. And the Global Mail found that between 2006 and 2012, there was at least $50 million spent by CETA uh, on Canadian mining, uh, linked to mining industry uh, projects abroad. And the <clears throat> uh, Bev Oda, um, after she drank her $15 glass of orange juice, um, she, she told a, the Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada meeting in Toronto in 2012, just giving a sense of how, uh, how intense the, the tie is between the Canada's aid agency and the, the, um, the mining sector. And actually, just to, to before going to Bavota's quote, uh, I, I'm sure some people saw that just a couple days ago, it came to light that SOCEDA has been, has been collapsed into foreign affairs. Uh, and so they have an advisory panel of five uh, external officials that are uh, sort of discussing how, how we can meld the foreign affairs agency and the aid agency, and uh, it came to light that uh, one of the five external uh, officials uh, sort of helping this process along is the head of Rio Tinto Alcan. Right? So the executive uh, is being specifically on this panel that's getting to direct uh, the direction of all of Canadian foreign policy, aid policy uh, going forward. But in 2012, Bev Oda told the Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada meeting. This is, she's the head of CETA at this point. She said, quote, the mining, she's speaking to mining executives, she said, the mining industry is a huge contributor to a nation's wealth and is one of the main building blocks of civilization. She went on to say, quote, I look forward to learning from your industry on how to improve the effectiveness of Canada's development work internationally and to working more closely together to create a better life for those living in poverty. Right? Everyone knows that the objective of a Canadian mining company is to help poor people. It has nothing to do with profits. That's not, that's not their objective. The objective is how can we get poor people out of poverty? Right? And here you have the head of CETA saying that the objective of CETA and the objective of the mining companies is exactly the same objective, which is either a, uh, is a, is a very damning uh, uh, comment uh, on, uh, on CETA. And so as part of this, this initiative, as part of this closer relations between CETA uh, and the Canadian Aid Agency and, and uh, mining companies, you have them spending all kinds of money on bringing even NGOs together with mining companies. So there's been a number of, uh, there's been some controversy over, over a number of projects where CETA and is, is funding projects that 
NGOs doing with mining companies abroad. And um, there is in a few different countries in Peru and Burkina Faso, she um, is putting millions of dollars in a project that's administered by NGOs such as Plan Canada, uh, such as World Vision. And these, the, basically how it works is that CETA puts up a couple million dollars, the NGO will put up three or four hundred thousand dollars, the mining company will put up four or five hundred thousand dollars. The project administered by the, by, the mining by the NGO in the community where the mining company is operating. In Burk I detail a little bit in my book on the one in Burkina Faso. Um, and basically the objective of the initiative is to have the NGO be, help pacify opposition to the mining company. And so you, 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 you throw around some, some development dollars administered by the NGO uh, in the community and that tries that, uh, to try to weaken the local opposition uh, um, to, the, to the mining company. And uh, as, as Sam mentioned, I don't want, this is not just something that's the Harbour government. The Harbour government has, has really deepened the pro-mining uh, orientation of Canadian foreign policy, but it's not something that began with the Harbour government. It's gotten worse, and Canadian mining companies have become bigger players uh, globally in recent years. Um, but this, this predates uh, uh, the, the Harbour government. And one example, I'm going back into the 1970s, in Jamaica. In Jamaica, in the late 1970s, uh, over 800 Canadian troops uh, participated in a training mission in, in, uh, in, in interior Jamaica. And at that time, a left-wing uh, Jamaican newspaper named Abang said basically the point of this Canadian training, military training in Jamaica, was to prepare for an invasion of Jamaica to, to seize Alcan, which was then Montreal-based company's bauxite mine. So this is what the left-wing newspaper was accusing at that time. A number of books on Canada and Caribbean relations had scoffed at colleagues crazy leftists who are just totally paranoid. Well, it comes, uh, it, by chance, um, a military historian by the name of Sean Maloney, who's a preeminent Canadian military historian, very right-wing fellow, he, he uh, looked into the issue, and he actually finds out uh, that there was an initiative on the books by the Canadian military. It was a planning exercise called Nimrod Caper. Caper. And this is Sean Maloney writing, who said, who's seen the internal files, and quote, the objective of the operation revolved around securing and protecting the Alcan facilities from mob unrest and outright seizure or sabotage. So here you have the Canadian military planning for an invasion of Jamaica if a left-wing government takes, nationalizes the mine or if, if popular protests uh, sort of hinder the mine's uh, operations. And, then, and then according to Sean Maloney, they continued to uh, uh, pursue this initiative into the early 1980s. And they continue to plan in this direction. So that's pretty extreme support of mining interests when you plan to invade a country to support, to, to protect a mine. Uh, a mine. Uh, another example, of moving towards a conclusion here, another example that Sam sort of alluded to is that in 1997, and this is important, this is I think an important reference, and I think it would be worth investigating this issue a little bit more closely, to understanding the the Institute here. In 1997, CETA launched a, uh, uh, I think it's seven million or nine million dollar uh, initiative to rewrite uh, uh, Columbia's mining code. And they seeked, they, they, they hired a, a, a law firm in, in, in Columbia, they worked with the the uh, CIRI, which is the Canadian Energy Research Institute, based at the University of Calgary. And they basically, over a four-year period, the, 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 uh, the project, they, they interviewed mining companies, asked Canadian mining companies what they would like to see in a new, in a new Columbian mining code. And over four years, they came up with, with, a, with a, uh, a draft mining code, which they actually ultimately got the Colombian government to adopt. And the, the head of Columbia State Mine Workers Union, explained the new, uh, the new mining code. He said, quote, the new code flexibilized environmental regulations, diminished labor guarantees for workers, and opened the property of Afro-Columbian and indigenous people to exploitation. The new code took uh, the royalty rate that mining companies paid, which was previously 10% for mineral exports above 3 million tons, 
and reduce that to 0.4 percent royalty rate, and uh, and uh, uh, slightly lower for for under a few million tons. So basically, just totally opened up Columbia's mining sector to foreign companies, and lo and behold, Canadian mine, mining companies have been doing very well uh, in recent years in Colombia. Since a institute based at uh, University of Calgary uh, was a part of this pro uh, project, uh, funded by CEDA to uh, um, uh, rewrite Colombia's uh, mining code. And so I think that's the, that's the sort of context we have to uh, uh, understand the Canadian International Institute for Ex the Extractive Industries and Development here at uh, uh, UBC. It's in the context of this corporate social responsibility project that conservatives are pursuing, which is designed to do, to avoid doing what's necessary, which is bringing in real regulations and chain mining companies involved in abuses abroad. And it's part of, uh, uh, presumably, it's part of uh, the process of rewriting uh, mining codes uh, uh, abroad or trying to push uh, the direction of mining codes abroad in countries like. Peru and elsewhere, where CETA has been heavily involved in recent years, um, in a way that better serves uh, international mining companies, which is primarily uh, um, Canadian uh, operating. And I think that the question we have to ask, we have to look at when we're, we're talking about the Institute, we have to ask, you know, what, what, what are the boundaries of discussion here? Is it, is it, is it a legitimate part of the Institute to say that, that we just keep the mineral resources in the ground? Right? Is that possible? Can we just say keep it? Not a question of like better practice. But just keep the resources in the ground. Many indigenous communities around the world, but particularly in the Andean region of, 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 of South America, that's their basic position. Just just keep it in the ground. We don't want this. Yeah, yeah. It might be lots of money to be made, but the gold's not worth what this is going to do to our lands. Is that is that a legitimate position? Can that can the institute come to that position and say we support? The indigenous communities who are living where these uh, uh, mineral resources are that say, we just don't want it, just keep it in the ground. Is that a legitimate position? I would venture to guess that's not going to be part of, of, of the debate. Um, and I think that more broadly, we have to look at this as this is part of, of basically co opting UBC into Canadian foreign policy, into a dis destructive Canadian foreign policy. Uh, and my, the mining sector is only one element of the destruction of Canadian foreign policy, but it's an important element. And this is about bringing, it, bringing UBC into that uh, initiative. And as students, as faculty, as uh, people who, who are part of this institution, the question becomes is, is do you want to be part of that? And you know, at, at what point, at what extent do you become complicit is, you know, is always a little bit tricky. But to some extent, if you're just a student here, if you just, you know, Paying tuition to the university, you just sort of uh, uh, you tell people that you're part of UBC, and simultaneously UBC is doing this abroad. You become complicit in the process, and do you want to be complicit in that process? And I would, I would, um, I would uh, uh, assume that the majority of students on the campus, when uh, uh, seen, when, when shown the facts of what Canadian mining companies are doing abroad, and what the Harper government is doing to support that and to block attempts to, to uh, uh, lessen the destructive elements, I'm guessing the majority of students will not be particularly fond of the idea that UBC is, is uh, enabling uh, 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 that process. I'll leave it at that. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Eve. I think that you brought up a lot of very provocative um, points about how Canadian foreign policy, especially now in the last, I guess, eight, seven years of the Harper government, has been very um, corporate driven, um, and how the academia and sort of um, diploma, Canada's uh, diplomatic corps have been very much implicated in that as well. So I think that Eve uh, said a lot of points that are worth discussing, that are worth thinking about, but I wanted to sort of open it up to discussion now, to questions. Um, I was wondering if you could please sort of, uh, how about um, briefly state maybe who you are and then if you want to have a preamble to your question, sure, but let's try and keep it brief and then have a question and seeing sort of how there's a lot of information to digest um, from Eve's presentation if people want to respond to each other's questions and I, um, that's fine, I guess what I'm trying to say is let's really have a 
uh, a civil and lively and productive discussion here about this policy and our university. So, uh, do we have any questions? Just, just oh, two, quick, two, two quick things. First of all, obviously, the, Sam, if you want to uh, be interested in some of the uh, question answers and the question for him. Uh, and also, just on the back table, I do have uh, some books, and those are available for sale, but I also have um, about a thousand Scott Parker's Crimes stickers. Um, that feel free to take them if you, if you leave before the uh, frame up all around the campus and all the different spots. And one last thing that I want to mention just before we get to the QA. So, we're sort of who organizes this part of a group called Doctor My Campus that we're trying to raise questions about this institute. You know, I'd encourage you guys to check out the blog, notformycampus.wordpress.com, and we'll be meeting later on today at three to sort of discuss these issues and what um, students can, can sort of do to respond to this institute, and we'll be meeting at three at the AMS Council Chamber, so that's top floor of the sub, 